And hello to you, Timothy Aslan. And hello to you, Ryan McDuffie. (laughs) And hello to you, everyone listening. Thank you for being here. Where is here? Here is Dismembering Horror, episode 125 of Dismembering Horror, the podcast true where myself, Ryan McDuffie, and myself, Tim Aslan. We dismember a horror film every week. To dismember a horror film, we talk about what worked, what did not work, and anything else that Tim and myself found interesting or noteworthy about a horror film. One that we, well, that we want to watch, that we want to see, that we're revisiting, that we're seeing for the first time, that we're watching because you submitted it. We're digging for the gold. We're searching for the silver. We're b- busking for the bronze. We, <laughs> we enjoy it all. <laughs> um, so- whether good or bad, hey, man, we're here for it. And What did you say, Ryan? Whether good or bad? Mm-hmm. We wouldn't dare watch a bad movie. (laughs) What do you mean? How would we know going into it unless we watch it? (laughs) We wouldn't dare subject ourselves to watching a bad movie, uh, blindly watching a bad movie after we watched a bad movie, meaning... Meaning if we knew we, it was as bad as we watched, as it was, <laughs> before we watched it, <laughs> we wouldn't watch it. We'd, we'd rate it in a void. It's true that we do want to see the best things that aren't bad, but I feel like part of the appeal of movies and specifically something fun about it with horror movies because the bad ones we still can get something out of in a special way. But it's like, I like Intuit, we're explorers. That's why I use the the digging for gold comparison too. I like to think that we're... we're so we're uh, prospectors? <laughs> we're, we're like, no, like, 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 like horror um, into the darkness astronauts, cosmonauts where you and I travel to all these different crazy planets with scary, interesting things in them. And sometimes, you know, we land on planet whatever happened to baby Jane and just have an awesome, crazy time and so much to talk about. And it's a classic. And other times we land on something like the girl next door and have a terrible time and don't want to even remember the movie. But the only way we would have known that is to visit Planet the Girl Next Door. So, you know, that's that's part of the fun for me. And it's just like anything in life. We couldn't have the good without the bad. So we're horror knots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> horror. <laughs> horror knots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and cool. as I said, here for episode 125 here today to talk about from 1977, The Sentinel, directed by Michael Winner, screenplay by Jeffrey Convitz and Michael Winner, based on the 1974 novel of the same name by Jeffrey Convitz. If if The Sentinel were, I think of The Sentinel as like a little piece of space debris, (laughs) you know, like from, from... ostensibly, you know, harmless, just floating through space, tiny little, tiny little speck of of debris. But when you're floating out in space, you know, horror nodding, you, you, you don't see it coming. And then that little speck of, of debris, you know, collides with your, your horror knot suit and punctures it and deflates all of your air. (laughs) <laughs> and you suffocate in the in the dark, lonely vacuum of space. Well, that's why we have each other, Tim, <laughs> so it's a little less lonely. <laughs> that's right. And you know what this film, it's funny, we're I like, like we're like the 
we're like the George Clooney and Sandra Bullock of 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 horror nodding. Oh God! I that now that movie's in a void for me. I did not <laughs> like Gravity at all. Um, it's a funny actually. I mean, how you describe it, we'll get into it. My experience with this film was different. I actually have seen this like twice before, like oh, over wow. the wow. like over the years, and it's always been this like. This that, even when we pulled it, and I was kind of like, I think I've seen that because I just remember the the priest dude sitting upstairs. But then while I was watching it, it was just like all coming back to me in a funny. I mean, it's been years and years, but I've seen this a couple times. So it is like this piece of like as if when we've been traveling along in our life watching horror movies, I see this piece of space debris, the Sentinel going by, and it's like I've been turned into it and been like. I think I've seen that, but there's something interesting. I feel like I've seen it a couple times before. It just keeps passing me by. So it's, I'll on, be it's on a particular orbit around you. Yeah, yeah. So I will just be. <laughs> I'm. I'm very happy now to catalog it in our scientific database here. Well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> I already know I enjoyed it more than you. Look at this. Uh, can tell. Well, uh, to say more on the Sentinel. We got to start with our trailer. So are you ready to watch that? Sure. All right, here we go from 1977, The Sentinel. It's one of the nicer tree line blocks in New York and only 20 minutes from the center of town. Oh, and just around the corner, there's a supermarket and the cleaners. That's Father Harron in 5A. He's blind. Blind? Well, then what does he look at? There is danger everywhere. There is evil. Evil everywhere. Turn around, Allison. Look behind you. There is horror. There is darkness. I think Allison may die. But watching, waiting, warding off evil, there is hope. The Sentinel. Before Howard, there was Father David Spinetti. Before him, Mary Thorne. All right, so then, Tim, would we tell ourselves to avoid The Sentinel, stream it, rent it, or buy it? Who do you want to go first? Hmm. Um, based on, like, three moments, I'd say you can stream it. As in three moments that we're bringing it up or down? Yes, that we're bringing it up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool, cool. I this movie was like it felt like a giallo movie. Is that just me? Like in so many ways? No, it does. It does. I agree. Okay, it's got that vibe. I. It's there's the movie. I don't think is good. <laughs> it's not. But it, there's some glibber, like great stuff in it. And yes. I think that there, if because it was made in the seventies, it just gets major points for me in that regard. Mm-hmm. And there are some in ideas in it that I do really like, like despite the kind of a lot of hokiness surrounding it. I love the lead, of course, Christina Rains. Mm-hmm. Um, so all that for horror fans, I'm, I'm for for me as a horror fan, I'd give it a rent it. Despite it, just, just there's there's a quote unquote vibe to it. I really enjoyed um, coming through of it all, despite I had some major issues with it. Of course, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder which ones uh, where we had our overlap or not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's problematic at times. <laughs> yeah. You could say that. <laughs> but it's it's also just like, I mean, for what it is, just a kind of eerie New York, yeah. uh, cr- like, yeah, 1970s horror movie with just this kind of like, it's kind of, I mean, it totally is just the exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, Omen knockoff kind of feeling thing. Yeah. yeah in some sure. way, in a lot of ways, I wish it was just knocking them off even more <laughs> that it wasn't. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. That would be nice. At least but, uh, that would be something. 
Yeah, but you know, as a fan of those movies, it's kind of really worth seeing for me at a rent it level of something that's like is a is a lower tier something of those that ilk. I don't know. It was it was cool. I thought there's a lot I mean, of cool stuff in it. I will say this: it's a bad indicator for me. So this movie is. It's an, it you know it's ninety minutes give or take I don't know what the actual number is but um, every half hour of this movie just by just by chance like when it like the first after the first half hour I remember like grabbing the remote and pausing it and being like Jesus where are we like how far <laughs> in are we and it was a half hour and I was like holy shit. All right, well, at least there's only an hour left. And then the next time I did that was at the hour mark. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm you know, exactly two-thirds of the way through. And then the third act, the third half hour, I actually enjoyed. Um, but it's just overall for me, it just, I don't know, it suffers from a, a few kind of just broad problems in terms of like I get it because it's kind of this it's a particular era and a particular style and that wasn't uncommon for you to kind of get like an hour of want wah and then a good final act but I don't know it felt like a slog to me overall for me it was the middle chunk that was the slog yeah. Um, or even the kind of like second half until the way ending was when I started. Yeah. But it, I I really enjoyed the trajectory of when it was more just, oh, I mean, we'll we'll get into it. So, right. sh- should we get into it then? Yeah. All right. Wait, well, no, I mean, we need I, to summarize I, it. You're right. I'm like using that as a transition for like, I want to say what worked. But <laughs> yeah, we got to summarize it here per our summary part of okay. our show. I think we can do this. Ready? Yes. Ava Gardner <laughs> is in this movie, which is cool. Actually, this cast is awesome. Anyways, okay, so here, here's here's the summary. Yeah, by the way, there's a, it's, it's kind of a stacked cast in a it's funny ridiculous. way. It's uh, ridiculous. Okay, so um, let's see. What's her name? Allison. Okay, here we go. Allison Parker is a model slash commercial i guess actor she's you know she's a very uh she's uh she feels sort of 70s like like not swinging but you know uh zest zest for life 70s new york model city living yeah uh getting her picture taken a lot you know by professionals and uh she she's (laughs) <laughs> this, oh God, this is so weird to me, but whatever. Okay, so she's dating Chris Sarandon, and he wants to get married. They live together in a, like, in a very nice apartment that overlooks Central Park, but he wants to get married and move into a nicer apartment oh, <laughs> looking overlooking Central Park, I guess. And she wants to move in on her own. That's the setup. Because as we learn later, she's had some she's she's had some some mental health stuff. And she's feeling like maybe she's not ready to to take the next step in this relationship. Uh she's been suicidal. I mean we're just given the summary that's important to the yes. plot. So um, due to that, she's looking for a new apartment and Ava Gardner is a real estate person and shows her this Brooklyn Heights, um, a really old house, essentially. It's like an old mansion, kind of, that is, that now has apartments instead of being a house. It's old and ornate and crazy. And has pocket doors, giant pocket doors, and uh, and and she uh, the price is right. Ava Gardner says, "I'll I'll let you have it for this crazy price for what it is," and she takes it, fully furnished. Um, and it turns out that everybody who lives there is a f- total nutcase, <laughs> and 
Um, there's a there's a guy who lives on the top floor that she never meets who's just staring out the window, so he's creepy. He's blind. And he's yep. Right, he's blind and yet he just sits at the window, you know, not watching things. And he's a priest. And he likes, you know, I, I get it. He's facing west, you know, still overlooking the, the the feeling of New York. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> so she starts to have these weird spells like she kind of f- seizure faints and they're getting worse and nobody knows what's going on and she as she gets to know some of the other tenants of the building like things are getting weird they're all a bunch of weird characters um she's kind of unraveling and you know, her boyfriend is concerned. Everybody's concerned. She starts experiencing spectral encounters, all that kind of stuff. She's yeah, there's, well, there's someone walking above in the, right. the floor above her, and she pretty soon finds out that even after attending a party with all her crazy neighbors, they she's told by the landlord that no one else lives there aside from her and the priest. So after right. learning she's partied and interacted and held the cat of a bunch of ghosts and stuff, <laughs> she, um, she continues her descent into not uh, into almost a literal hell. Basically, we learn right. the clergymen of uh, the, ca- the Catholic uh, di- di- what is that word? Diocese. Diocese. They, they, this, this is why it seemed so maybe... Um, uh, giallo, but it's this this apartment is a portal to hell, and the Catholic priest is the one defending it. And all these ghosts are like evil demon spirits, and someone always has to be assigned to defend it. And so she's being ushered in as the replacement for the old priest. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know what's what's up with uh, the main dude, the main bad guy, Burgess Meredith. <laughs> he's kind of the he's the leader of the the demon specter group, and I think and he's just the most sociable. <laughs> yeah, okay. But there's also this thing where a lot of the specters that she sees, like the people who live there, are specters essentially, like from hell. They're all former. They're not. They're not just d- random, arbitrary demons. They're all former, like killers or like bad people. So it's actually the souls from hell um, that are, you know, uh, there. I don't know. They're why they're assigned to this particular portal to hell. But they got they got that job assign assignment. So that's where they're posted up. Um, and yeah, you know, her boyfriend kind of he he kind of does the a little sleuthing and he unravels this reality a realization that yeah, every that the uh, it's sort of ambiguous to me. Maybe you can help me understand this. Every is it the church that is finding a new sentinel and then okay. like Having them, they have to die on the same exact day that the the existing sentinel dies, and then they aren't actually dead. They're just replacing the the new sentinel and becoming a priest or a nun. Did you understand yeah. that bit? I mean, how you it's, said it is about what I gleamed. Yeah, but it's the church that is doing that. Like the church is picking the person, or is or is the or is Satan picking the person? Right. The church has a book <laughs> with all these people, so it's got it's the church. But, but it it's feel, like how it did feels they, like Burgess Meredith was like, "You're the one. We're gonna make you." Like, kill yourself. But, but you'd have to rewind even more, like, as far as how did she end up at that apartment? How did they get her? That's where it's like... Right, and it's, I mean, the answer is Ava Gardner, her real estate agent. Right. Who, who's evil? So my take <laughs> on it is this. 
Ava Gardner is a messenger for Satan and is trying to find the right fit for the house so that the Satan, the souls of, of hell can drive her crazy or that person crazy enough to kill themselves. And then they, that would then break the church's attempt to replace a new sentinel. But that, but the church seems like they've already figured out that who's going to be the replacement. So it's very, it's a little convoluted. Let's put it that way. Right. And there's a lot of stuff like that where it just made me think I'd, want to read the book slash I Mm -hmm. wish it did a better job at adapting the book. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know, I had that thought a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like there's cool stuff in here, but like it's just not quite executed the way that I think it, it, that maximized the cool stuff. Yeah. Great. Well, are you ready uh, to dig into it more then? Um, yeah. I mean, the end of the summary is she becomes the new sentinel. Dun dun, and she's old and blind and watching over the, you know, uh, the Hudson River or whatever that is. And they, is. they redo the, East the River. they, I guess, tear down the apartment and build a new one, and she's in that new one, or they redo it or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I, regardless, hey, another shooting location I hope to go to someday. Do you know that neighborhood you lived in? Dude, New York? you know what's so crazy is when they fir- when we first get there in the movie. I was like, oh, shit, that's that's where a friend of mine li- – like, I, I looked at a map. I, I'm pretty sure he lived in, like, the building uh, – it, it's essentially the building nor- north, like, the next block that's, like, touching her building. Whoa. I was like, I, I'm pretty sure he was in that – there's a, you know, there's an old crappy – building that's there now i don't even know if it's still there but it was when i lived there and i remember going and hanging out there a couple times because that little so where that little turnaround is i've parked literally parked in that turnaround okay so you have been right there so i'm like (laughs) oh my god i've been exactly where this is it's crazy little did you know at the time tim we'd be here today (laughs) little did i know all right, well, let's get into it now. Next section, what worked? What worked? What worked for you? What worked for you? It worked like a charm, Smith. <laughs> what worked? What worked for you? What did work? Christina Rains. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty cool. She's pretty compelling. Yeah. I thought she was very compelling. I loved her, man. She was great. <laughs> she, she, well, I'll get into a reason later what did not work having to do with her, but um, no, it is no fault of her own. But as a someone, a likable someone to follow who you're wishing the best for and who's just like fun to re- watch reacting to all the craziness around her and who's just kind of inherently endearing um yeah man she's she was a big part of why this was a rent for me i i mean i can get behind that she's and, <laughs> she's cool and compelling and yeah maybe that's also in comparison to i <laughs> this is i guess this is a what not worked but i wasn't too crazy about chris sarandon sarandon in it yeah um it, but i think that was more his character mm. Or honestly, yeah, like no, as, I can see that. I, as, I don't know. As He's, great as all the like actors were in this, there was a god. This is this. Sorry, I'm just putting this. What did not work, but in context for why maybe <laughs> she worked so well for me is there was just something that felt like I wasn't too comfortable with them all or everyone else, or it was mm-hmm. just kind of not. I don't know. wasn't wasn't feeling too good to be with them. But with her, it was always the breath of fresh air and seemed like the the rightful through line through the film the enjoyable through line anyway do you think it was his little mustache <laughs> made me made me chuckle no <laughs> no um yeah that yeah i i get what you're saying uh, yeah but so I, she's I, she's cool you know what i i think mm, i mean it feels purposeful in a way right like it endears us to her 
to have everybody around her feel a little off. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I I could get behind that. I don't know if that was intentional, but... Me neither. (laughs) Um, And, you know, a big part of probably else what I enjoyed about her and, and everyone else in this film, this is so just like... Maybe too why I say like just the fact that it's in the seventies gives it a you know helps boost it to rent it for me. High waisted pants. Yes, the fashion exactly. <laughs> I love just looking at everyone in this. It was so cool, and I'm like, oh my god, that's just why I like vintage clothes and try yeah. to like take a lot of my inspiration from there. I just loved how everyone was put together. Oh man, when. Like, she's in those white pants. It's just so cool. He's always, like, looking snazzy in his suit, little mustache. Just cracks me up. It's just fun. Yeah, I the, loved it, there's man. like um, There's, like, a, a red outfit that she has that's, I forget exactly. I think the stockings and the shirt match, but the, the skirt is, like, a different shade of red. <laughs> and it's so, it's so 70s, but, like, like good, good, old fashioned 70s you know not like not like whoa what the hell were they doing (laughs) it made me think of my grandfather who was like the king of the pastel matching pastel top and bottoms like matching belt like the whole shebang (laughs) it's cool mentioned him in his fashion before grandpa that's (laughs) funny pretty fashionable dude (laughs) So, Considering that he's from Michigan. So, like Tim, you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, go on. You mentioned th- three things that were like that you enjoyed about this specifically. You want to tell me one of them? Okay, yeah. Um, the. Okay, well, they're all pretty related, I guess. But so the movie really kind of picked. Well,. The first time we see it, I was like, all right, okay, I'm into this. This is this is something and interesting. Is her first flashback of catching her dad having a little like weird orgy three something. And that whole impetus for her being messed up and suicidal. Um just the way like the the sort of going all out for it, like it it's it's very you know, there's two ladies rolling around with each other being super because it's her it's her memory. So it's all a little skewed. Um, they're all rolling around and like eating cake and stuff on the bed and being naked. And her dad is like very skinny and old and craggly looking. Um, but when she like sees it, he's like, get out. It's very like intense. And, and he hits her. Yeah, I like that whole scene. I was like, okay, now something's happening. Like, I'm, I'm into this because it's, it just felt that, and I, and it made me understand her very clearly. So, like, super effective, um, disturbing, and and just the 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 set decoration of it all was very creepy. Well, what was so it reminded me almost of society in a way of where yeah. what's or or parts of the omen where it's like this rich, well, you know, established what like her you, we get the sense her father's just like maybe high up in government or business or something like right. that. But just and you know, she's just kind of a, a schoolgirl wandering the, the the grounds of this ridiculously large estate mansion place. And there's this there's just something off and eerie about about that as a location and that as a idea and the thing being around the, the super super wealthy. It's um I don't know. It, it added to it all in a way that was just like oh I get why she's uh not having a good time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it it really felt like that the tone of that was the movie for me right like does that make sense yeah um and i wa- and so when it happened it happens fairly early right um let me think about this it's at her the whose whose funeral are they at aren't they at a funeral what it happens during the beginning of the movie i remember is kind of during the setup 
as far as yeah. the flashback. Yeah, I mean, she's at this giant estate, right? And her mom, yeah, they're mourning. I don't, are they mourning the father's death? I don't even remember. Regardless, I kind of got this vibe that, like, because because it happened somewhat early, I was like, cool, we're off to the races. We're going to get a bunch of, like, flashback haunty stuff. So when the next time we get that, even though there is a big gap, I think, I think is is like the the best scene of the movie is when her she, you know she's being haunted she's hearing the footsteps she's kind of realized that things are amiss and that like she's already checked to see that the upstairs nobody's living there so like stuff has kind of gone down I think this is basically the end of the second act um and she sees her her the ghost of her dad and attacks him and s- cuts his nose off. Like that whole sequence of of her being attacked by him and like fighting back. That is, to me is the – that's the best sequence of the movie for me. Like it's so f- messed up and creepy and gory in a really like – I don't know this is weird to say but in a pleasing way. Um, maybe it's the middle of the movie. I don't know. But like, either way, that, that sequence, I think really is the, the standout sequence for me of the, of the movie. You know, if the first one was tonally, you know, setting it up, this one landed the movie for me. Tim, I agree entirely. That scene was incredible. And I thought it was it's it's why it's a large part of why it was boosted to a rent it. I'll put it as like that was some real Ari Aster shit going on, man. Right? When it first when when he, it, the ghost is sort of standing there, but like behind the closet or cupboard or whatever, <laughs> and it just yeah. like just kind of does a straight walk across the room, just yep. kind of like uh, the the intent behind it that it's it's, it's wherever it's coming from is just so eerie and weird, and he's like mostly naked. Oh God, man, that was that was some really good stuff, and I feel like that's kind of why why we we watch all these movies that you know in the end maybe aren't the best of the best, but it's like that's what we're right. doing here for the the nuggets of gold within. Perhaps I mean I that was incredible, incredible that whole sequence. The way when she chopped off his nose, how it just felt like he was like just made of of uh he, he was he was just like play doh or something. He was just ready to fall apart, you right? Know? Yeah, <laughs> and just getting that like bony nose structure underneath it. Um, I thought it was, it was incredible, man. I love that scene. Well, and it also to me, it's I mean, I guess this is. Yeah, this is a what worked, but it sets up what I found to be the most interesting, potentially interesting component of the story, which is there's this sort of like, oh, man, is it a B story? It's really kind of a C story, but I guess it's part of the B story of her boyfriend and the cops. Like once we get Eli Wallach introduced as this detective, we have this other sort of thing going on where, you know, when they find the body of a former, uh, what was he, kind of an op- opponent of some sort of Chris Sarandon's. And he was that- a detective who was on the case of Chris Sarandon's, Michael's, um, I guess, ex or previous wives. That's- that's right. Uh, the previous su- supposed wife. suicide that yeah. I guess we learn was actually like he had something to do with killing her. He had her killed. Yeah. By I don't know. He hired a guy to kill her. Anyway, I like to think it was my favorite character, Perry, who is the guy who helped him out uh helped him break into the church or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that guy? Oh yeah. Hello, it's good. Good to see you again. It's been a while, Mr. Lawyer. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. Yeah, that whole subplot sort of side plot thing of like the motives or I don't even know how to kind of parse that together or apart whichever you do. But I I was kind of more intrigued by that 
component. And like, I would much rather be watching a movie that is kind of ha- is a detective story of like people dying, like a, a murder, maybe serial killer t- style thing that's happening that is a subplot of this story. And then you realize the connection is that her visions, her acting out on these visions she is the accidental serial killer because she's being haunted into doing those things, which is effectively true in this movie, but not really a focus. It's sort of a, I don't know. It's just a sort of a plot point. Like it's there. It's all ripe for the taking in the text of the book, but Mm -hmm. it's not executed that way. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of doing that. Yeah. So I love that though. Like, that whole idea, right? The second we find a body that has the same wounds that she inflicted on her dad, Spectre, I was like, oh, that's cool. I mean, that's just those little elements, too. I mean, again, maybe I wish there was more of it or they played on it more. There's some kind of payoff. But, like, I loved the stuff where you have, yeah, Eli Wallach as Detective Gatz and his buddy Christopher Walken as Detective Rizzo, who doesn't say much. But anyway, just when you have these kind of like hard-boiled New York detectives dealing with the supernatural, like that's that one line that I think was in the trailer where um, Eli Wallach's like, um, uh, or Christopher Walken says, haven't you ever uh, attended a party with nine people or nine murderers who are dead? And he says something like, oh, haven't we all? Or something something stupid like that. But just any stuff of, yeah, detectives like that pushed up against the inexplicable, the supernatural, I love so, so much. Yeah, because this, this, uh, the construct of this type of story is so, right now, a thing that I love. Like, it's the type of story that I want to kind of be making in in insofar as the the themes that you can pull out of this which is you know things like certitude and you know like belief in in the supernatural or the um you know the 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 people who think everything is rational and has to be based in fact and truth and certitude around that coming up against people who are like, yo, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm I'm being haunted. And when you have it oh, being a woman, it becomes kind of this broader thematic, I don't know, allegory for how women, you know, are uh, dismissed often by authority or not taken seriously or gaslit or like all of those things. Like those are things that we now, you know, sort of in the zeitgeist, and this movie has those, but it, it unfortunately doesn't, I don't think it really looks at it through that lens. Well, ex- experientially, though, it, like, I love how it plays out. And, like, let's see, as far as we exper- we're experiencing meeting all these neighbors with her. And they're weird or whatever, but they're just, they're just like weirdo neighbors. She goes mm-hmm. to the party with them and all that stuff. And Burgess Meredith comes in, kind of barges in and is being all friendly. She sees the picture of him that's, you know, in the pre-furnished apartment. But then to get the reveal when she's being shown around the same rooms that she was just in as like, you know, cobweb ridden, haven't been lived in for, for years mm-hmm. and years. It's just, it's a not even subtle like way of just sort of experiencing this like, wait, how is that even possible, you know, induce crazy with her? It's, there's, there's, yeah, as far as what you're getting at, like that idea of, you know, feeling like you're crazy or not, there's just something, I don't know, there's just something specific when it's just so obvious of like, or not so obvious, but just like, so maybe, yeah, so obvious. Blatant. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly, blatant. These things I just experienced that were just almost kind of casual and didn't have much about it just didn't happen at all. Like, the, the, like what, what, like, just down to the diesel, like, but she was dancing with him. Like, what was she experiencing? That's what, that's what I'm getting mm-hmm. at. It's like, what was she actually experiencing then? So that's just, like, what's so haunting about it. I, I, I really, really liked. Yeah, I, you know, and we, we can kind of circle back to this because I think they're inherent what didn't works within that. Yeah. 
Um, but like that, that thing of, uh, man, how, how, how was I going to put this? The thing of you realizing that you have this problem that nobody is going to really believe because you understand that it's unbelievable, but you had the experience and you, and you know, watching a character have to be like, yeah, I, I know, <laughs> I know what I'm saying sounds crazy. And yet I'm saying it cause I, I had the experience and then seeing them have to like cope with that and be like, well, shit, am I crazy? Like what is happening? Crazy people don't ask whether or not they're crazy. Like, you know, like is what is real. And like, We've talked about this. It's one of the scarier things, right? Like, how do you convince people who are convinced you you uh, are not credible of a thing? Like, remember in the in Sisters when she gets to the asylum and the, and the the crazy dude is the doctor pretending to be the doctor. She's screwed, right? Because the authorities are just gonna believe that guy because he's in the position of authority and and nothing she says will get her out of that situation because they could just be like yeah but you're crazy of course you're gonna say that there's a little bit of that in this i mean they don't go down that pathway in the way that maybe i would like like and that's that's like the rosemary's baby way or the exorcist mm-hmm. way where it's like just so hard to get anyone just to like listen to it all and it feels like everyone's only out to betray you and will never take you seriously. Yeah, yeah, and like those movies they do this in a in a different way and I think it's per- it's probably my biggest note or um you know what didn't work in the depiction of her character. But you know we still, in spite of of them doing it this other way, we still are endeared to Allison. And so that's good. I just, I think what I'm saying is it's like a really good framework for some really good fertile ground. And they didn't, they didn't, what do you call it? They didn't till the field. Well, <laughs> here though, there, there was one, there was this A scene in it that I thought was a nice little till. Um, even though like maybe a lot of details around it didn't really make sense or click or whatever, but it was really fun when the, when she's seeing a different text that, than that's the boyfriend. the coolest thing. Yeah. And she's, so she's reading Latin. So he's like, okay, well here, write down what you see. And it's just like a fun way where it's like, well, he knows that she doesn't know Latin, so she can't just be making it up. So that was just one of those fun, like, okay, uh, oh, a way to get him to maybe, you know, to uh, spur his investigatory mode. That was pretty yeah. satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh man. I think what I want to just to to make sure we get back to this is just to say she she as a character is needed to be more actionable and she's not right like she's sort of the things are just happening to her and there's a I think there's a place for that to a degree um but unfortunately they kind of they take a turn into let the the man be the 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 actionable person who actually takes care of things and figures things out um but watching her so having said that that is a what didn't work that I'd like to explore more but watching her go through the thing and unravel she's really good even though it, it, you know, it's still sort of campy in seventies at times. I, I never felt like I didn't feel like rolling my eyes at her unraveling. Exactly. And so, you know, I guess testament to her as an actress. Um, but man, there's there was so there was such open ground for really nailing her character as like this. I think she. If it was done differently, I think she could have 
this character could be like a a uh it, it, it would have like held the test of time better you know and like become a iconic character like like the rosemary's baby type thing hey we'll get to that yeah. um <laughs> but hey w- while watching this in this limited spectrum of just this film i think she yeah. felt iconic and carried it in that sense um you you know you're kind of touching on just the themes behind this and what's the actual story going on i gotta say that was and as an aspect wise maybe i should have mentioned it more up front but just the actual story of like what's going on Mm. i just think is so freaking cool you have a portal to hell that's in a a, a, what a brooklyn apartment building yeah old apartment building (laughs) yeah we don't know exactly why she's chosen or she gets enlisted or whatever but what it's like yeah we we get it, writer. We know nobody wants to live in Brooklyn. It's <laughs> shitty. Everybody wants to live in Manhattan. I did, don't understand those references at all. It looked a great <laughs> spot to me. Um, so, and then, you know, and then, but that is filled out a bit more too of like, it's these, these churches are the, the gatekeepers, like literally, or, or the portal keepers. And um, they, it, it, at any kind of stuff that's just like, uh, you know, deeper supernatural conspiratorial yeah. Catholic stuff is pretty cool. Like, what's that one that we watch with the 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 nuns on the island or whatever? Like, that's some neat stuff in there. The Irish one? No, was it Irish? Well, there's no. Dark Water. Yeah, that one. That one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but think about what I love so much. And, you know, once we get to the ending, we finally get, okay, what's going on and everything. But I... I really love like kind of the best endings and especially best horror endings. They do, they kind of have like a confused morality to them in a good way Mm -hmm. of of right and wrong. So like this whole film, you know, I'm feeling these, these stoic Catholic priests or whatever, they feel like the bad guys, you know, they have their, their weird cultish ring. Some of them, she's talked to one, she talks to one like in a kind of confessional way and then comes back and he's not there. And like they start off the movie and they're, they're serious priest meeting and everything. And (laughs) we know, and and basically we like her and it just feels like they're just taking advantage of this poor, poor woman. Yeah. Yet, yet, we know that they are doing it to prevent hell, evil spirit demons from being unleashed unto our world. We don't know if this is the only way, if there's a better way to go about it. It seems that this is just sort of this weird, like it's presented as it's just this horrible, tragic, um, uh, just, just fact of life that someone has to basically sacrifice themselves to protect this portal, whether they'd like it or not. So, so with that in mind, I'm like, if, if accept that as a given, which is kind of against our morals of like, no, there's always a way if you do the right thing and don't in essence kill her, you know, there, there's going to be some way to overcome this evil or whatever, but no, there it's presented as there's isn't. And this is just a given. And that's, (laughs) that, that's, I don't know. That was pretty cool. That conflicted morality of like, Oh, the church, actually at the end they feel like they're the good guys and even you know in the way they kind of have their moment of saving the day or whatever but even beyond that it's like no they're just doing what they have to um yeah i I like this ambiguity right like there's you kind of don't know who to trust and that's that's fun um and it seems like kind of overall maybe this is this is kind of in between for me of working and not working, but like the, the crux of her story comes down to the, she's committed the unforgivable sin, right? So in, in Catholicism, you can't try to kill yourself. Like that is, that's like a, a big one, like a very serious thing. Um, and she's done it twice. And so now it's sort of this like third time's a charm moment of are you going to be a sinner and give in to that horrible thing and effectively, you know, 
be it's sort of like you know it's the same as like you you you're basically denying god and accepting satan in in in, in a sort of broad way right if you do this sin or are you going to kind of repent and accept this uh it's almost a punishment but it's sort of like a punishment with with uh uh, a conditional punishment it's like will absolve you of this the the worst sin of sins that you've done twice <laughs> but in return you know you get to live you just have to live under our you know as a as a nun uh and you have to sit here and be the sentinel for the rest of your life which is a good thing Right, like it's for the greater good. So, in a way, they've boiled it down to trying to kill yourself is a selfish act, and you can redeem yourself by by accepting this selfless act that has really big implication. You're you're doing a really really good thing, but you're kind of, you know, you're sacrificing yourself in a good way this time. And I I like all of those things. I think there's some moral ambiguity and and like personal uh interesting conflict within that um but you can you can save your butt tim i'll save my butt (laughs) (laughs) because i still with a lot of other things that worked for me i want to mention yeah the I thought it was maybe this is a little t- not a little touch, but it was just once it happened, I was able to get on board with it in a fun way all over again. Y- when you see the pre- priest sitting up there, and it's just maybe we're just because we're psycho accustomed, it's just so easy to think, oh, that's <laughs> he's yeah. dead or whatever. It's that twist, or there's this he's a monster, what you know, something like that. He's like, Andy Warhol. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, but the moment where the other priest enters from behind, and then the blind priest sitting in the Careful. window moves his head, like who we think is maybe like dead or whatever. Yeah, like it was just like, oh shit, what this this priest isn't just a dead body sitting there. It was, it was just nice getting that confirmation somehow. Or yeah, from behind yeah. we see this blind priest sitting there, just tilt his head like even almost looking like a corpse that just moves all of a sudden. That uh, there's something cool about that. That was handled well. Well, yeah, I mean, I see this is that kind of thing to, to my last point and to what you're saying. There's something very cool about this, the selfless sacrifice, like the, like you've been, you've, you've accepted that this is, this is what you have to do. It's, it's really scary in a way, right? To that fate of having to sit in a chair, <laughs> basically do nothing for the rest of your life for the greater good. It's sacrificial, like anything is, like that. Yeah, that's really scary to me. Like it, it, it like gets under my skin. But like, you know, it's cool. It's 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 a freaky, cool. It feels very seventies to me. I don't know why that would be related to the seventies. Maybe it was just a, that was a thing um, that came up in in stories a lot then. But either way, that idea of being relegated to to just this almost coma like life is really scary to me. And we know there's this extra weird, horrific element to it going on because she kind of instantly turns old and blind when she turns into the Sentinel. Well, you know, I, I wondered about that. I, I, I think you could have a different take on that, that there's an implied jump in time, that, that, that it's 50 years later or something like that. No, but it was the same um, realtor, the same what? I, oh, that, well, well, my argument again to that oh. is that she's she's a, remember she's a messenger for Satan. Yeah. She doesn't age. Got it. That'd Got be it. my. Got that it. was my. I kind of was like, if that's what they're going for, I'm into it. <laughs> Got it. But either way, I'm I'm with you. You know, like 
your version, I think, is very cool, too. It's like she's – it's almost like she's putting on the the garb along with the garb that she has to put on. Well, what's Yeah, what's so cool is about it, it's as if she died – to then, and as if dying, yet also still being alive in some form, allows you to sort of walk both worlds of the beyond and the living, the dead and the living, yeah. by sort of being both dead and alive herself. It is cool. Yeah, you know, it feels. I, I don't know if there's a um, if there's sort of a reference in there, but it feels a- allegorical or not allegorical. What am I trying to say? Um, what's the word? Uh, it feels archetypal. Yeah. This sort of the old person who watches over feels like a character to me. Um and maybe that maybe it is. Maybe it's it's based on I'm not a Bible person, so I wouldn't know, but maybe maybe there's something in there. Um but I I like it. I I think it's it's weird and creepy and it's it's conflicting to me yeah right that that whole idea of especially because of who she is as a character beforehand right the setup of her being the person who in a way is only successful because of how she looks right she's not she seems to not want the fame part of things at all. But she enjoys at least the work of being a model. But like we see that through, through as she starts to unravel the thing that gets affected first is her work, right? She starts to have spells during work, people around her, like the quote unquote kind of superficial, you know, people around her her friends the photographer the the makeup people whoever costume people whatever they're the first ones to kind of be like oh what the fuck's wrong with her you know what i mean like they turn on her pretty quickly because she's no longer a commodity that can help them that director was pissing me off so much who is mad at her for not exactly. placing like he was just like god give her a break like uh quit yeah. being such an asshole to her i think that was jerry orbach Right, yeah, like it was, you know. So that whole thing has that. There's a theme going on within that that I think is really smart and works. Like making her be that, you know, it, you could you could relate it to to today, right? It's like it, it's it's almost equatable to you know, like an influencer, right? Like your the people around you are sycophants. They're not real friends. The, well, this is a I'm making a generalization sort of thing, but like thematically speaking, right? Like you, we could understand that really easily, this idea of how superficial and sycophantic that world can be. And that in its own way is sort of the counterpoint to having a purposed life. And so I think that that in this one, it really works to use that as the setup as as she starts to actually uh, meet her calling, if you will, to make this decision to 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 live a pious life, the superficial life that she's in starts to disintegrate around her. Yeah, and I think that's good. That's smart and and effective. And I wish they had maybe done a better job of of emphasizing stuff like that. But whatever, it's there and it's it's right in my opinion. So Tim, kind of like you said regarding the thing and the thing from another world, you said, but we got to get to the real meat and potatoes here. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The real meat and potatoes for me in here, we talked about, I mean, the main thing probably was that scene we already talked about, the ghost dad and attacking him. But like all the stuff leading up to that of her Mm -hmm. interacting with the neighbors like mm-hmm. this is so good, and then after the fact, when you learn they're dead murderers, just adds this whole other level of feeling like you were just taken advantage of, and just in yeah. all kinds of weird ways. But like, man, talk about what I wish I was watching this with you when um 
when we have uh, uh, Sylvia Miles and Beverly D'Angelo, this like <laughs> yeah. weird, like I guess lesbian couple. I don't know. Just kind of have some I mean, kind they of say something it. going they on. They outright say it like three times. Like it's like it's a, a you know a horribly evil thing. Those lesbians. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Well, when she goes over and it's just like the weirdest, they offer her coffee and then Beverly D'Angelo starts masturbating while looking <laughs> at poor Allison. And you're just like, dude, like what? God, I wish I could have seen you reacting to that, Tim. Just like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, well, I was like, yeah, oh, no. whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yep, there but it just, is. It's doing a lot just to feel like, oh God, invaded. Even before that, with like, I, I don't know, when she. Oh you know, my God. It's I mean, just how whole Allison vibe is. is but Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're just so, I, they're so like, uh, I don't know, inappropriate, I guess. They're just like, so, in, they're, in, they're not inappropriate. They're invasive. They're like just their demeanor. They're offensively carefree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. like, I like personal space and, you know, some semblance of boundaries and maybe, like, when you meet somebody for the first time. I I will say this. It, I, it's, one of the things that bothers me the most in life and maybe the only, the only part of, of being in a pandemic where you have to stay away from each other, the only, the only upside to that literally the only one is that your personal space isn't being invaded that much. And people who do that, I, it, I hate that when people like you don't know, touch you, even if it's like, they don't, they're not, it's not malicious intent. Right. But like when people, you know, you know, shoulder slappers, I hate shoulder slappers. Like I hate that whole thing. And this whole scene just feels like an extension of a shoulder slapper in the like most uncomfortable way. I I get what you mean. It can feel kind of like condescending and, and weird in a way. Um, I always just, I just meet them right back at it. Like whatever they give me, <laughs> I just, I just mirror it. And like, I don't know, it seems to bring it to the level. It's fun. Do you've seen the Seinfeld, right? With a close talker played by... What's oh his, yeah, what's his yeah. name? We were just mentioned from the Santa Claus movies, uh, Judge, um, Reinhold? Judge Reinhold. Yeah, he's the close talker <laughs> yep. on Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Is that would you do the the Kramer approach where you just like totally just like flip out? Like, what the hell are you doing, crazy guy? I love what Jerry no. does. He just <laughs> completely stands his ground and just like <laughs> you know lets him get right up there. It's like <laughs> like just takes it. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> I think in the in the past, I was more of a Jerry reaction where I would just be like, uh, and I'd kind of slowly try to distance myself. Well, that that's not the Jerry thing. Jerry is the thing that where he's like, he, I'm, he's totally just confronting it head on and like not moving oh, an no. inch and just letting him do it. No, it's so I, funny. I, I will I will back off. Yeah, yeah. But what that's I will what what I've realized and this is a tangent, but what I've started doing now is you know just being like you're too close to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like just back off, dude. <laughs> it's I just, I just love just that a little, episode. It's, it's so kind funny. of empowering. He's a but close yeah. I mean, talker. to the point of this scene, you, you, that feeling that we know Allison is having and going through in that scene. It's just like all you can do is feel for her and just be like, "Whoa, you! This is this is a lot." So that's still the potatoes. We still got to get to the meat of it because then Burgess Meredith, I thought, was so good in this. He was the other standout. He's awesome role in this. Like yeah. he's always great. But um, to have that flip where he's being so friendly and has like a cat and a bird on his shoulder. It just seems like a sweet old man, kind of invasive, but kind of like kooky. So he's kind of cute and fine mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, she's, she's just kind of chuckling at him. Um, to have then someone who's, uh, who's, who's putting out those traits and making us feel a certain way where we want to trust them so bad and kind of just let ourselves go to trusting them, to have them do the turn of they are yeah. actually an evil ghost murderer who only means ill will towards me and are like literally, you know, part of hell or whatever. It's yeah. like, 
when a twist like that happens with a character, it feels like it's almost especially uh, pernicious or evil in a yeah. way. Yeah. Where it's like they they will be that much that less questioning of their own evil, that they're just that much forthright actually of being evil or certain of being like, you know, whatever their evil beliefs are. And it's just a sort of a more sinister, disconcerting way rather than like the couple, the lesbian couple who are just like weird from the get go. And it just kind of all fits, you know, it's like a knowable threat more so. But when you have Burgess Meredith do that turn to an evil guy, it's just, it's just, it feels, God, it really, you know, gets under your skin in a way. Yeah, that I mean, look at the end. Uh, the The end sequence is really, really good. Hold up, let's get to that, Tim, because we've talked about the potatoes and the gravy, but I still got to get to the meat of all the neighbors stuff that's <laughs> earlier on. Isn't that the meat? No, Tim. What's it's the Je- meat for you? Jezebel's birthday party. <laughs> Come on, man. All right, all right fair enough. Fair you enough. know you know me at this point. If it's like a weird, <laughs> some sort of like just just party dance macabre scene with a an, as we learn yes, a room full right. of ghosts. It's incredible. Cause it, I mean that's the scene. I mean, a you have it, what's going on is that's that is the scene where she's in a full room of them who we learn is later be ghosts. So it's incredibly just eerie later on when we learn that, oh yeah, I went to a party with them. The way she's meeting each of them where it's like the everyone in the room is kind of looking at her as some kind of, you know, like, ooh, a, a, a beautiful, you know, innocent, youthful, just something to kind of stare at and just like, you know, I, I don't know, like as if they want to suck her life force or something in a way. But that is also <laughs> relatable, you know, as far as, you know, if you're, I imagine, you know, older and, you know, you just are excited to see the grandkids or that so they bring a certain energy to the room that just, you know, help light you up. But then, of course, that it was... <laughs> That it's Jezebel is uh, Burgess Meredith's character's cat, <laughs> and he puts he puts a little party hat on Jezebel, and it's oh. just so funny. And it, I love like when um, Allison like smiles at him, you know, when she come, first when she first comes into the room, it's just so cute and funny. And then like he gets Burgess Meredith is just so excited. Then the polka music starts, and they start dancing. It's that, that was incredible. That was like the sort of close second, perhaps tied scene for me as far as the uh, the, the the ghost dad scene. Mm, I I feel you. I feel that. I feel all of that. You know, it makes me feel like uh, there's so much about this movie that made me have that feeling of of oh, sh- th- you're on the right track, do more of that. Or, like, take advantage of how good that is. Yeah, you get how that kind of just weird insanity craziness felt akin yes. to those flashbacks that you liked so much. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And and look, when, because we get those scenes, the ending is that much more, like, poignant. And, like, yes. and like oh, shit. I'd love to talk about um, the ending more now since you were kind of getting to it. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, 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 there's so much I wish, like, the trappings around the the, the dinner of <laughs> the meat and potatoes that, that didn't quite uh, make it for the best meal, but the, but... What you're saying, and, and I think I'm agreeing, is, is that those things, those meat and potatoes, are really good. You get to the you get to the end when we when we see Jezebel eating the the bloody canary or whatever it is. We you know you're like oh shit shit's about to go down, and largely that's because of those previous scenes. It's like we've been conditioned by the movie to know like here we go. Um, so what is the ending? Are you asking me? For you, I mean. Like where where do you where yeah, like where do you feel like it it is it that moment like so sh- what what happens right before Jezebel's eating the canary? Well, okay, the ending though, no no, sort of starting after that. I like I like that 
the boyfriend's dead and we sort of have the reveal oh, right, 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 right. of the side of his that, face being torn off. Yes. And then and that's I what mean, I was going to say that uh, that whole concept, that thing is one of my most favorite things. Yeah. Like that, that, whatever you call that, that, that thing of the, I guess it's a, uh, it's not a misdirect. What would you call it? It's a, it's a hidden, it's a hidden truth, right? Like we think he's okay and he's just turned potentially. And then we he turns literally and we see that he's been killed. Yeah. And he, this is his ghost. I, and man, that, that is the, sh- that is the sweetest, the sweetest like creme on, on the creme. <laughs> well, I just liked it as just a kind of almost like a just an action set piece, like a just kind of big finale of you have all the the demon people, whatever you want to call them, kind of just shambling into the room. And it's like the classic, like the priest having to use their their crucifix to kind of save the day. And it's all glorious right. when they hold it up and they kind of part the seas of the people. And then what it really got to is how... This this really simple effect, but I just thought it was so cool. Where it's kind of like we have a wide of the, the 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 demons or whatever you want to call them, the ghost people, walking back against the wall, kind of some kind of t- towards the door, and then when you cut mm-hmm. to the reverse of like her, the priest or whoever, and then you cut back to them, they're just kind of there's less of them. There's no effect or anything yeah, yeah. of them disappearing. Of course, that's so obvious and so simple. But it, it worked so well. If just to have that off screen, their disappearance, I, I really, really liked that. It's sometimes it's one of those examples of like Simple's most effective. Yeah, that whole sequence kind of is doing very, very simple things in a super effective way. Even just her like kind of running up the stairs and, you know, we're seeing all these people there are, it's got kind of a uh, Dawn of the Dead feel to it of like they're they're like you said they're um what did you call it they're they're kind of rambling no they're not rambling they're like sh- shuffling and they're yeah. there but they're not like trying to get her so much as just she now sees them all um and they're in a way i mean really the movie says what they're they're there to to push her toward killing herself without like they can't do it right um they can only make her feel so crazy that she chooses to do it ultimately and that i think that leading up to that it's it's the exact same thing that we saw in climax where the group around you is egging you on to kill yourself and i remember just being like having burgess meredith like giving her the knife and being like, go for it. And she's like, she's sort of hesitating or whatever. And he takes the knife out of her hand and turns it around so that she can hold it in a more effective way. Like that whole thing, it, and with all of them just sort of around her being like, yeah, do it. Kind of, they're not actually saying that. But like, they're egging her on. That's the scariest thing of the movie to me. It's because it's like her her demons personified Exactly. And like we know, obviously, we've seen, I guess we've kind of forgot to mention this. We see her cut her wrists in the flashback when she catches her dad having the little three something. Like we watch her actually take a razor blade and, and cut her, her wrists open. So this moment is really poignant, right? It's it's very much the like, you know, now's your chance to to do it, but do it right, which is really a horrific thing to contemplate, you know? To be like, you can to be cheered on to, to slit your wrists with a dagger, you know, like and cheered on like you've you've tried a couple times already. Now's your chance to really do it right. Like that's so messed up. And with all of these specter, you know, whatever you want to call them, not zombies, but what do you want to call them? Uh, Satan's minions. Yeah just kind of looming there and her boy, her dead boyfriend, like that whole thing is just so weird. And it, I think what really lands too for me is like, in a way it's the, it's the same thing. Well, it's what I talked about before, right? Like it's a weird, like evil mirror of the, 
the world that she comes from. You know, it's everybody's eyes on you thing. Like, watching you perform uh, and, like, cheering you on as a crowd. It's the, it's the weird, like, dark side of fame or, or uh, uh, celebrity. Do it, do it. Yeah, and they're, like, they're, they're rooting for her, but it's, it's not for her. It's for them because it's a thing that they want. It's, it's very similar to, to celebrity, well, that's why it is creepy, though. It is for her. She wants to, on some level, commit suicide. So it is like, she, well, that's right. Know. Yeah. No, you're right. That, I mean, yeah, again, it's that's really the, the the mixed thing. Obviously, it's not for her betterment, but as far as just yeah. that sort of subjective point of view, what what you maybe want, you know? Yeah, I like how complex that those sort of ideas are. And the conflict, just to, as a character conflict, to be like, you know, it's actually very similar to whatever happened to Baby Jane in the in the ending, right? She she's in that one. She's getting what she wanted all along, which was this attention. And this is sort of doing the reverse, where it's like she was getting attention her whole life for for being a model, and now. She's getting that same attention in the worst way. So I, I I dig all of that. I think that's really cool. I feel like it's time we should talk about what's not so cool. Yeah. Yeah, then everything falls apart. No. <laughs> all right. So here we go. <laughs> what did not work? It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? <laughs> I mean, I guess since we're talking about the ending, can we just yeah. like address the a severely problematic and I mean, I felt like it was just really exploitative aspect of that ending and of other parts of the movie, right? Like this whole idea that if you have a physical handicap or deformation or are a lesbian or are there any other really blatant ones i mean you could say being Um, old like the being old yeah that those are all equatable with evil and like hell like that's really problematic (laughs) i i agree i have that down you know, import taste the ending in that way. But honestly, I do, this is a safe space, what may be a pointless feud on my part to play devil's advocate here. Apologies if need to be. But like, in real life, especially, you know, and I, I like to think where this is all the, the, the human journey of society, journey of evolving past things, these things, lesbians old people physically handicapped whatever they do make people feel uncomfortable even you know even more back then and it's in the right. same way of no, like i think that taste tasteless problem. jokes you know where right <laughs> where i think that's how we process these things as a society it's largely through art that may not be like it's not correct, it's not right, it's not portraying them in a good light, but I think by sort of putting our own demons and prejudice up there, it helps us get through them. Yes, I, I, I agree. I think that we have a responsibility when we see stuff like this to say, yeah, you're, you're completely right. For a very long time, depictions of those things have been equated with the discomfort that is maybe not inherent but has been uh mm, has been promoted within those things and then those that it becomes kind of they're feeding each other right we need to point out that that is a problematic and b b just incorrect right like from a hum from a human side it's 
it's dehumanizing those characteristics to just say, ooh, it's creepy and, and makes me uncomfortable. It's like, we need to acknowledge that, yes, that may be true, but it, sh- it shouldn't be true. And we can, we can advocate and express the, the, or at least remind people that those are human beings, right? And that there's nothing wrong with any of those aspects of them. There's no inherent evil within those things, which for many, many years in all sorts of different ways has been uh, promoted as the way of looking at those things. If you're yeah. different, you're evil. And it's, that we just need to be acknowledged that that's a, a pretty unevolved way of looking at humans. So, yeah, totally. It's, yeah, you got to call it out to move forward for what it is. And it's important to just voice it, put it out there. Yeah. I'm like, I think the like, thing that when, bothers me, honestly, is using, is using actors or, or hiring people who actually have some sort of, whatever affliction or deformity or whatever or or maybe i i feel like it's a, it, it's potentially exploitative if the person who you're hiring doesn't cognitively may not understand what they're being asked well, to represent that's what i want that, to that, that, that like part i me. That's what I want to know, though. But I don't want to make assumptions one way or the other. I, I, genuinely, I, totally. Like, I'm I've not heard saying of, that every person there it, that that is the case for every person in that movie. But I think that there may be people who that was the case for. Maybe. But it's like, why assume that when we don't know? Like I've heard of just as yeah, I've heard plenty yeah. of cases. Like all the people that were in the movie Freaks, the little people right. who were in the Munch, Munchkins and Wizard of Oz. Like it's that they're they're down it's like no it's cool i like to be featured you know it's it's fun i I, it's cool to be i like horror movies i want to be preserved in a film it's at least Mm -hmm. it's and on some level too it's like context aside it is using real people who should we just be we just should be seeing more we should help normalize it by seeing Mm -hmm. them at all Mm -hmm. by casting them in movies so i mean i i like it for that i like that they cast actual people in a way you know assuming that they were down for it and blah 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 but like that's right it's it's very mixed but i i but there's a certain part of me that is like is it a bad thing to like just put them out into the world you know like no but i think i think the key is the acknowledgement of of the the potential problematic aspects in relation to reminding people uh you know to to not exploit other people <laughs> right it's just you like, know what I mean? when like I'm we don't a- know the the reality of that and so right. Hopefully, <laughs> it was all above board and everybody was being respected and, like, not exploited and blah, blah, blah. Chances are, in 1977 New York, that that might not be, have been the case. <laughs> so, you know, we're just sort of acknowledging that and calling yeah. it out. And if it were – if it is and was problematic or, like, in some way affected those people negatively, I think it's it's our responsibility to – acknowledge that and advocate for the appropriate uh you, whatever you would call it appropriate uh uh um what am i trying to say the appropriate way of doing things mhm don't be a dick i guess <laughs> <laughs> this was all, yeah, that was definitely something I wanted to note, but for me, a more a things of note versus a what did not work. It, I think for me, it, it, it's one of those things where you want to hope that your instincts are right. And my instincts said, some, this doesn't feel good. So I don't know. I, my yeah. instincts can be wrong, but that made me go, oh, oh, oh. oh. And and I think probably you know for me it takes me out of the movie because then I'm suddenly going oh shit you know like I I don't feel good about this so that's why it's a not it didn't work for me thing I mean yeah for me in my own little isolate bubble I'm like I like them and I liked seeing them 
and I didn't complicate it more than that, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, which is fair. <laughs> yeah, so there's more, you know, to stay on the ending, though, the what did not work for me about that was her the whole thing of like making it uh, working in the big climax her character thing of her like maybe slitting her wrist at the end i just didn't buy that she would at that point not so much because like it's totally out of the realm of possibility but just the way the movie handled this is a way to get into the rest of the movie too. Mm-hmm. But the way the movie handled her like subjective I'm going crazy experience, it just wasn't subjective enough with her to make me feel right. her decision of should I, should I not kill myself? You know, it was just, just none of what should have held that weight was there for me at all. Like, like we should be... Like we should be feeling like this is her her one way out of her hell that she's just been experiencing and this has been getting more and more hellish and trapped this whole movie. And maybe this is the way to escape her fate is by by succumbing to the evils around her. But it was just kind of like there there's nothing behind it, it felt like, when that was the sort of crux of a decision for her. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my big problem with the movie is sort of what I was saying earlier about actionable character she she just kind of lets everything well she it's not her fault she didn't (laughs) she didn't write the movie (laughs) the way the character is portrayed is that allison just is experiencing these things and I, i it's just not good protagonist writing you know like at a certain point now granted the one time the Times we like her the most are when she actually, you know, does something. And it's only, it only happens like twice. You know, she, when she, gra- she's like, I've had enough of this because the chandelier's rolling around and then there's stomping upstairs. She grabs a knife and goes up there and, and chops her dad's nose off, right? Like, we like her then the most. But for the vast majority of the movie and anything plot wise that is, wrapped up in figuring out what the hell's actually going on is left to her boyfriend. And that, I just hate that stuff. You know, like, she's the main character. She should be the one saying, I'm losing my shit, but I need to figure out what the hell so I can self-actualize. Not have somebody else tell me how to. Yes, I totally agree, and I can... Honestly, that's what made me check out where it felt like the first half third, I don't know how long it was, but the first chunk of the movie really did feel like her story, even down to being kind of like hesitant or not crazy about the boyfriend and getting like being with her goal too of just wanting to move out on her own for the first time and getting her place. Like all that, even if she wasn't active per se, she was still leading it and we she was sort of following her her curiosity, you know, she's yeah. the one who went over to the neighbors or whatever They're, it may right, be. Exactly. You know, but then all of a sudden it just halfway through whatever it was, it felt like it just totally flipped to he's the one who has to step up and while she's just, you know, on, getting drugged and the friend has to take care of her or whatever it is. She is doing some stuff but it's it's not i don't know it's just, it's it's not what i wanted and that is when the movie just kind of turned into slog mode for me was when dude what, what is his name alan michael <laughs> <laughs> alan when when michael took over it's just like ugh, i'd get back to her especially you know and also just for the reasons that i was already kind of saying like to build to this big ending where she's going to commit suicide or not like we should be feeling her going crazy with her and we just don't have that yeah yeah i mean there's all there's all sorts of ways to depict somebody unraveling but the danger is always that you make it only about the unraveling right like i i unraveled yesterday and there were many many things going on in my unraveling right like in my thought process and it can't it's never singular and I think it's really – that's a, a trap, right? Like when you're writing a protagonist, if you feel like you're just on one note with them, if you're just honing in on one component, you're in trouble because people are complex. And 
part of the unraveling should be the inherent conflict of the many different thoughts that are going on, right? What's happening? What's my purpose? Am I crazy? Why is like what got me here? Um, you know, can I solve it? Is there a solution? Like, you know, are there clues? Is there more that I need to know? Like all of those things, if you're if your protagonist isn't sort of going down the list the, and somebody else is doing all of the heavy lifting to get the audience information, you're in trouble. And like you'll lose us really fast. Like I don't care if Michael finds out that the that the Catholic Church is doing this stuff. <laughs> Huh? Right? Like, who gives a shit? He has a cat burglaring scene. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> like, it's so stupid. <laughs> you know, like, I need her to actionably go down that pathway. And then, look, he could do – I I would have him do that stuff or want to do that stuff, like be the advocate for finding out these things and have that be his demise, which it kind of is in this. But he goes too far down the rabbit hole and becomes the only person who's getting information. So even we could have even had, you know, this is sorry, you are on a so. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, Yeah, even though. Like everything we're saying is, yeah, she should have been doing more, blah, 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 blah. That's true. It's kind of funny, though, how that also could apply just as much to him, where like you could have less of him doing something with the cops. Like you said, you know, working in this other story of the, the, the you know, he's yeah. working with detectives angling. And then had it be a bigger moment when he gets killed at the end. Like, have we could have been with him also, sort of as, you know, sort of sort of B story going on without necessarily taking away from her side of the story, but supplementing it as someone else who we kind of have come to understand and like, you know. Right. Well, and and he's <laughs> who who is he, right? Like <laughs> in relation to her in a who is he emblematic of well, that, in yeah. it, nothing he's just a dude right well no he's he's a a bad dude too like that's the whole thing where it's like i never knew kind of didn't like him from the get go but you want to trust him at the same time it's just it was just not handled cleanly at all if right. like the fact that he hired someone to kill his old wife like <laughs> right, like right. that's huge yet yeah, it's just sort of i don't know there wasn't anything given to that it was just <laughs> It was weird. Yeah, he's not used in an effective way to reflect her problems. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I think it's because they almost in a weird way shift the protagonist like components to him at one point. And it's like we sh- we should be suspicious of him by then. We shouldn't be like, oh, on this fun adventure to find out the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She should um, be finding out the truth and going, <laughs> oh, my God, not only am I, a, like, you know, <laughs> been chosen to replace this sentinel thing. Is that what it's called? Yeah. But also I've discovered through the cops that my husband had his ex-wife murdered. Maybe he's trying to – maybe this is him trying to ma- drive me crazy. Like, if yeah. you weave those things together, then that's – it's more it's more for her – to be like, holy crap, my whole world is upside down. Like, I can't trust anybody. I don't even know what's real anymore. And then we're kind of off to the races of her character and, like, to the point of the movie. Like, what do you do when you realize that you – everything around you is a lie, right? It's the same It's the same thing as her main issue, which is she caught her dad doing a thing that she – that, you know – messed her up to to see right like the person who's supposed to represent like safety and boundaries and love and all of those things that make sense to us lied about that and that is the impetus for all of her problems is the lie and that never really it's sort of vaguely there with michael but, like, it never is driven home in a way that makes us, the audience, or her, the character, go, I'm doing it again. Or not I'm doing it, but it's happening again. And we need that. 
Yeah, so much of this is like so many, you know, it's just generally, I think when things didn't work for us, it's comes down to missed opportunities, just not totally doing these things you want. So like the other big one for me in this was, I don't know, the, a big one, but considering, you know, how much I did love the party scene and her interacting with the neighbors. And on some level, like here, I, and, and of course, what I, I said I already liked is, you know, how it is just sort of presented in this matter-of-fact way when we're seeing the ghosts, as if they are just real people. It's not shot any different. It's just like, okay, go and mm-hmm. meet the neighbors. No big deal. They're just kind of weird. I think you could do a best of both worlds, though, where it's it seems like it's just as if there's nothing weird about them. Yet you could do a little something that just sort of at least like when maybe more so when going back or playing on your instincts, that's like, oh no, these are dead people or whatever. Like I or, would or have loved that. You know, just in, if, in how it's shot in a simple way. This uh, like doesn't have to be overt at all. Like nothing like, oh, it doesn't have a reflection or and no. nothing weird like that. Just like the film should just know that they are dead people and just something in how it's simply presented is is embedded in that way, you know? I, I One of my favorite things in movies is when, when somebody has a secret, right? So they all... They all have a secret, right? They're they're Satan ghosts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I love it when a protagonist something catches their eye and we the audience see that, we go, "Wait, she just saw something." And then we don't get to see it. We get to see the aftermath of the person who's got the secret covering it up. So, you know, like let's say uh let's just say that one of the lesbians uh, was shot by the other one. That 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 they they it was a uh, what do you call that a uh, um, a, a, a suicide and you kill yourself. What's that called? A, a double murder, murder suicide. Yeah, murder suicide. Right. Let's say that's how they died, and that's why they went to hell. So there would be gunshot wounds on their person, but. Of course, there's Satan ghosts. They would be covering it up. But what if she, you see her kind of tilt her head like, whoa, what's that? And then you cut to one of the lesbians and they're literally just like pulling their shirt over the hole. And you never see the hole. You just see the move. You go, whoa, what the, what's that? Right. Like the why? The intrigue of those little things. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, that it's, is the best stuff. It's weird because like, I feel like that was written in there. Like, let's say as far as. Uh, the Burgess Meredith neighbor coming in and her finding like the old black and white picture of him, yeah. looking, you know, in his suit. Like that's that is that moment where you know we look at it and she sort of go, something is weird about this, maybe, but maybe not. But instead, it was this kind of like oh, we're just looking at a picture. I, I was, you know, it's like not. Yep. It's and it's weird because it's subtle, just in like how it's shot and cut and just. How how it just so almost sort of like intentionality comes through in ways that are just well just kind of magic in the film the way that only film can do it just I don't yeah. know it's I can think of it as put it as just it's your viewpoint your intention you know what a shot communicates for you when you're making it and that just stuff was wasn't being done <laughs> right. Yeah, I I had one, you know, along the same pathway, and I just it it's, it has just left my brain. Well, Tim, how about did it throw you off? Uh, that wasn't just me. That that was a totally weird voice dubbing Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> There's a lot of ADR in this movie, but like it wasn't his voice, right? I. It didn't sound that's a like good him. Question. It was it's like, certainly- hey, hey, you're. Yeah, yeah, I, you know. Blah, blah. I think it might be his voice, but it's him. It's him doing ADR for his own voice and t- trying to not be Jeff Goldblum is what it felt like to me. And therein lies the problem with this film, Tim. Yep, you are too. It's the kind of approach where it's like you're. This is the kind of thing with some people too in films. You are so concerned. This is making a lot of assumptions here, <laughs> but but when you're so concerned with like being weird or different or distracting, that in trying to not be that way, 
you actually are more weird and different and distracting. Yeah. If he's kind of In got a, a bad dis- way. Yeah, if he's if he's got a, a, an actor that's not established but kind of has an interesting voice, like that's that's it's it's the lifeblood of of humanity right, right there. Right. Jeff Goldblum's idiosyncraticness, like why it, it doesn't matter what the movie is. Like yeah, sure, dub. You know, you can have creative reasons for dubbing over voices or whatever. But it felt more like a that approach was like an insecurity place you know coming from i again make a lot of jumps and assumptions here but i'm gonna make a jump and assumption that the studio had demands they specifically greenlit this movie because of the success of the exorcist and rosemary's baby and they had too much say in the product and once that starts to happen often this is the result is you see these little these little glitches of filmmaking that don't feel true to a filmmaker's sensibility. They feel true to a production or producer that's outside of the storytelling sensibility. How does this happen? I just don't get it to where you have this. It's, it should have been like another exorcist Rosemary, but it totally could have been right up there with those. How, when you have studios giving feedback and everything, yada, yada, like, all these actors stacked cast. How is it not? It, here's better? here's the thing. So, so much money behind it, right? So I when I went to AFM, AFM, yeah, AFM, the American Film Market for the first time to pitch a, a screenplay. The thing that stood out the most is that when you're talking to the the people who are green lighting, this is not true across the board, but in this particular realm, it is. When you're talking to the people who are going to potentially be the distributors or financiers of a film in this kind of market way, they are literally looking for four things. Will it do well internationally? Number one, it's all just money metric bullshit. Will it do well internationally? Does it have a name at all? They don't care who the name is. They just care that it is a name. Does it have nudity? So chicks and explosions. Those those are the things that they look for. It's such a dumb set of metrics that don't really, like, they don't mean anything, right? Like, they're just crunching some weird numbers. And that's what this movie actually feels like, unfortunately. They're, like, checking off the boxes. Do we have a bunch of named stars in it? Yes, check. Do we have boobs? Check. Do we, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I I will always resist that argument because you can do all those. That's never, having those things as markers to hit are never an excuse for not having a good movie made out of it. You know, they could have- No, I I agree. I'm agreeing. I think that 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 mentality is super flawed. But to be, I guess, but more specific as far as where people's, that those are where priorities are versus also making a good movie. It all depends on who has final say. Mm -hmm. Like who's driving the outcome. But again, you can have the person who has final say like just be concerned about those things, but then they also, you know, they wouldn't care whether it's good then. You know, being good on top of having those things isn't a deal breaker for them if all they cared about were those things. You know what I mean? Well, what I think it does is that often it it muddies the water of the intention of the filmmaker. And so when you have somebody who's very strong-willed, I guess, as a filmmaker, and they tend to be the ones that stand out and last longer— You know, so in this era, Roman Polanski stands out like, do you think studios were coming in and being like, no, 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 you need to do. He'd be like, fuck you. Get out of my face. This is my movie. You know what I mean? Like he's he's that type of guy in the same way that somebody like Catherine Bigelow in the 80s, you know, you better believe that execs were coming to her and being like, yeah, I don't really, you know, she did do this because we need this and that. And she's like, get out of my face. I'm doing my thing. You know what I mean? So like. When I like, I don't know who this director is. Do you know who this director is? Michael Winner. I think it was his first time directing. You know, when you, that's a very, I think, maybe not. Well, I think it can be common, and it's often, you know, just a reality that 
filmmakers, if they allow the studio to get in there and meddle and whatever, and they don't put their foot down, you can often get this murkiness where it's like, there's some really good stuff in this movie, but then there's some stuff that just is weird and doesn't make sense. So I don't know. I, it's it's I, speculative I, on my part, obviously. Right. And I actually started off speculating this completely different reason where like, I didn't get the sense of bad because of studio meddling for this one. Like the, if, if, if it was an active decision to dub Jeff Goldblum that way, it feels like that was on part of the filmmakers, not a studio demand for, That's for whatever fair. reason. Like, because in the rest of the movie, just these basic sort of connective filmmaking threads that the studio, that the kind of thing that studio would just be oblivious to of just kind <laughs> sure. of making it all click and, and sort of track together. Those aren't studio. Yeah. They, they aren't like decisions being made. It is just sort of like in the, 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 the fabric of the film itself. That's why I look at it more like the faults. Yeah. You know, I actually, I mean, I, I can see it from that angle too, as a possibility where you had a studio who <laughs> you potentially had a studio go, this is a sure bet. Let him do his thing. And then his thing came back and they were like, ooh, ooh, we, ooh, <laughs> there's too much nudity. We can't sell, like, we can't sell this. I feel like the reaction would just be kind of like, what did you think of it? I don't know. I, I think it was, I think it was good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> you know, just, you know, know, yeah. And then they go and they walk out into the alley to have a cigarette. And one guy's like, we're fucked, aren't we? And the other guy's like, yeah. I don't know if it, I, again, I don't think it's that <laughs> bad though. This isn't a total <laughs> shit show of a film. This is no, but you know, tons of you, missed potential, but yes, yes, exactly. Anyway, I don't, I don't think there's much more for me to get down into the dirt on. It just right. doesn't quite land, you know? <laughs> But if you haven't seen it, uh, I mean, we hope you've seen it if you're listening to this. But yeah, let us know. What did you think of Jeff Goldblum's voice in this? Was it indeed dubbed by another person? I kept going back and forth. It was really weird. Great. All right, So Tim. much missed potential. So then uh, next section, ready? Oh, yeah. Things of note. This should be interesting. I mean, in a way, what we've just been saying is sort of things of noty, but whatever. Yeah, well, hey, we're here now. I mean, I didn't really have anything aside from just I wanted to give a special shout out to one of my favorite character actors, actors out there, uh, William or Bill Hickey. William mm. Edward Hickey. He was he was the guy who was like the who helped him who helped the boyfriend out on his sleuthing stuff. Who goes, yeah. uh, "Oh, hello, Mr. Lawyer," or whatever. He's <laughs> he's uh Uncle Lewis in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh my god. He recognizes his voice in uh The Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, he's like the wheelchair Frankenstein guy. <laughs> Dr. Finkelstein Oh, my creation. He's um <laughs> plays the grandpa in Adventures of Pete and Pete. And then one of my all-time favorite films that I think is just severely underrated, not talked about, but is incredible by the great director Gore Verbinski is Mouse Hunt. He plays the ailing father in Mouse Hunt, William Hickey. Huh. So okay. it is one of my... <laughs> One of my favorite character quotes in anything ever. He has it like framed below a painting of him. It says, a world without string is chaos. Because he's like a string, his, he's a string uh, owner, factory owner and loves string. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it says here on his Wikipedia, this is so accurate. In his later years, Hickey was often cast as, quote, cantankerous but clever old man roles. So perfect. And just because I'm, I'm on his page here, hey, and if you're a fan too, it was fun learning this. I haven't seen the movie Prizzy's, Pritzy's Honor, but he's yeah, nominated for the Academy Award for that, for Best Supporting Actor. Wow, yeah. I, I mean, for me, honestly, it's just the biggest thing of note is just how ridiculous the cast is. Yeah. It's crazy, the, the, <laughs> the number of people that are in. Of course, it is very much like kind of a cavalcade of like, 
New York actors of the 70s. You have Eli Wallach. I mean, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is one of my favorite films. Right? So cool. I mean, come on, dude. Just Ava Gardner alone is amazing to me <laughs> that she's like that. Hey, there she is. Well, of course, though, you know, the most amazing, though, is William Hickey. That's why I had to just start with that. <laughs> That's right. Um, other than that, yeah, I mean, Christopher we already- Walken and Jeff Goldblum, though, is kind of, it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think the, the, you know, the attempted cash in on this, uh, I mean, it's very, we've said this already, but it's very well known that this movie was made specifically to try and cash in on the success of previous movies like Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby and, you know, and The Omen. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and- it's weird. I, I do want to always like, challenge that though as far as why should just because something comes after say like it is cashing in on like sure I'm sure it played some part in you know giving the studio comfort and green lighting it green lighting it but at the same time like well just because you're also doing it doesn't mean like it shouldn't just be looked at as its own thing ushered into existence but of course like I get you know you can't not make the connection which I was doing too yeah anyway you know what's fun People like um, what do you call it? Uh, reviewers? <laughs> Is that what you call them? Am I having a stroke? Critics. Critics. Thank you. <laughs> Some of the stuff critics said about this movie is really funny. Here's here's one. Robin Wood described the Sentinel oh, as the worst, most offensive, and repressive horror film of the seventies. Uh, Variety said the Sentinel is a grubby, grotesque excursion into religious so relig I think that's a typo, psychodrama, notable for uniformly poor performances by a large cast of familiar names and directed uh, and direction that is hysterical and heavy handed. I don't know. I like right. let's well can we offset that with a positive one here? Here someone from Dread Central said uh, maintains enough of a chilling atmosphere to keep fright fans engaged. I'd say that's accurate. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, look, it's gotten recognition in, since then. I'm always yeah. very like the 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 critics of the time. I'm like, whatever. I don't care what they think. Well, actually, it was fun. His uh, a fellow British director, Edgar Wright. I watched his um, trailers from Hell coverage on this film. He was a big fan. It was fun. Oh, to nice. See. Well, cool. Great. No, it's not without its merits, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. I mean, we're, um, we talked we talked a lot in things that worked, so. Yeah. Take that for what it's worth. Well, if that's it for the, is that it for the Sentinel for you, Tim? Yeah. Great. We shall put a bow on the Sentinel. Thank you all. Thank you, Sentinel. And move into, let's get our recommendations out of the way here. Anything you'd like to recommend, Ed? Um... I can't remember if you recommended this at some point, but I finally turned on The Marvelous Miss Maisel. I have not seen it. Man, it is ridiculously good. Ridiculously good. The writing is so amazing. Uh, It's hilarious. Uh, And, of course, the acting, it's gotten a lot of praise for the acting. Uh, It's all great. So check it out if you haven't. Awesome. I have not. Uh, well, this is something that I'm sure doesn't need any, it's, it's, it's no deep cut here. A lot of people are watching it now, but I was just so taken with Pixar's new film, Soul. Did mm. you watch it yet, Tim? I did not. I, I thought it was great. I did not like Inside Out. I have yet to see that one too. This felt like it was the, like what I wanted from Inside Out. It was just there, there's some weird stuff in Inside Out for me, and this one was great on so many levels. As a, as a just a piece of appreciating music, and uh, or a piece of what am I saying? It <laughs> as a bar, as a, all the things it was doing on just sort of a story character level. Just in the filmmaking itself, it was one of those where it like felt like it it made good use of being a 3D animated film, just sort of animation wise, which is something mm. that isn't 
always done <laughs> with these films. Yeah. Um, so just uh, as far as that, that's just a, maybe a less mentioned thing about it. But um, and then as far as the music, yeah, just like how it's filmically portrays going into the zone, so to speak, or whatever they call it in the movie. Um, when you're playing music and s- some really standout jazz performances in it too. Performances all around. I, I thought it was great. Definitely up there with my favorite Pixar films now. All right. Soul. Cool. Great. Well, I believe what? it's your turn, isn't it? Yes. So could I tell you when to stop and you could show me that little piece of paper? I sure can. Or you sure can. Great. And stop. Stop. Here we go. Here we go. <gasps> the Blob! <laughs> yeah! Hell From yes. 1958, not the 80s one. Though I, I think almost we feel like too. we need to double feature the, this one and the 1980s one, but let's I just think, do this one. Yeah, we'll just do the other one at some other point. Yeah. Dude, I'm, I'm very excited, Tim. And let's see where we're at. I'm trying to see if we're going to beat our current record of watching six pre-19 or watching six pre-2000 films in a row so this will be our fifth in a row so one more after that will be tied and then one more after that if we get it our longest stint awesome this is what i was hoping to watch sooner rather than later i'm glad we're. i'm gonna have to i think this is one that needs if if it exists finding a really good like blu-ray copy it it, i'm pretty it does have a criterion release all right (laughs) <laughs> it was sold <laughs> yeah <laughs> the blob after the stuff too which is just so great um, oh yeah the blob the stuff love it all great great well until the blob oh it's just great to say the blob blob <laughs> oh it's just one of those words where it just it captures what it is you know it's a blob <laughs> Anyway, until the blob, which I'll be excited to say even more. Thank you so much for being here where you can find us at dismemberinghorror.com, wherever you found us. We got an Instagram, we got a Twitter, we got stuff like that, all that jazz. Anything to add to that, Tim? Uh, no. Great. We just thank you for being here so, yep. so much. Um, and yeah, hey, and <laughs> that, is, that is all I want to say. That is how we close out. Uh, it was a, a natural way to put it, but I'll just say it again here. As we do do when we close out, it means so much. Thank you for being here. And we will see you next time. Goodbye!